All right, here we are again. We are looking at the about three quarter of a way point through on seminar 11. I think we're reading for tonight um, chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16. This is our penultimate get together. Our last one will be a two weeks from now, and we'll look at the final four chapters of this seminar. Now, this seminar is extremely important. If you've ever wondered about a midway point for Lacan, this is probably it, where you can see him turning away from the symbolic and desire toward the real and jouissance. And I'd like to suggest that a lot of this is apparent in the chapters that we read for today. So with that said, I wanna start with some very sweeping claims. Claims that are anchored in our readings, claims which we can support with passages from the text, but claims that are nevertheless quite extreme. First, to be a human is to be an organism and a subject. Now, so far we've talked a lot about what it means to be a subject. And the closest thing we've come to talking about what it means to be an organism is to talk a little bit about embodiment. Here in these chapters in seminar 11, it's very pronounced, this aspect of organismic life. Second claim, to be an organism and a subject is to be sexed, S-E-X-E-D, sexed. You'll note Lacan is very keen to point this out as a fundamental aspect of his theory of the drive. He says, hey, y'all, you've been making fun of me for leaving out sex all these years and talking about language instead. Here's sex for you. Sex is back. Let's talk about sex. And so he does. Third claim. To be sexed is to experience a certain part of one's living, embodied, organismic being as lost. When the human body as an organism is subjected to the bipolarities of sexuality, something gets lost along the way. Say again. Okay. Fourth and final opening claim. By way of the drives, we deal with certain other objects, all objects that are stand-ins for more primitive objects, notably the breast for an oral drive, excrement for an anal drive, the gaze for a scopic drive, and the voice for an evocatory drive. By way of the drives, we deal with certain other objects, all of which are stand-ins for these more basic uh, objects, the breast, feces, the gaze, and the voice. And here's the hitch. In such a way as to recover from these stand-in objects and to restore for ourselves what Lacan described as this earliest loss, this experience of real lack. So here it is schematically. If you have an oral drive, it doesn't mean that you are obsessed with breasts. There are lots of other things that stand in as the object that gets your drive riled up, spinning wildly. That object is ultimately going to refer back to something like the breast, whatever you experienced at that phase of your life. Lacan's adding something more to this very typical discussion of drives. He's saying, and beneath that primordial object, whether it was a breast or not, is something else that was lost, that was really lost. And the word for this, as we're going to see tonight, is libido. This is the term that Lacan recovers and reinvents out of Freud and assigns to this real lack, this real lack that emerges when the human organism is sexed, subjected to the bipolarities of masculine and feminine, male and female. 
Let's see if we can zoom in on this a little bit. What is this loss of life that the organism sustains when it is taken up in the dialectic of the subject as a sexed being? This loss of life, as Lacan puts it, what is this thing? What's lost in this moment is the fact that at root, there is nothing in organismic life that can or does represent in the subject at the level of the psyche, the bipolarity of sex. There's nothing in organismic life that represents the bipolarity of sex in and for the subject. In other words, this bipolarity exists only at the level of the norms and orders of sexed social life. So if you're into seminar 20 and you wonder what Lacan is eventually going to be up to with regards to the sexual relation, rapport, lack thereof, start here, check it out. This is the closest thing I've seen next to his essay on position of the unconscious, which is very much in correspondence with these pages that we're reading for tonight. This is the closest thing I've seen to a very elaborate and direct social constructive theory of sex in Lacan. It, that shit doesn't come from nature is what he's saying. The bipolarities of human sexuality and the drives that refer back to them, that signal back to them, are socially constructed. We're going to talk about that. We're going to figure this out. Lacan even puts it very brazenly. God did not make us male and female. God, he says, did not make Adam male and Eve female. We did. It's a brilliant point that he makes. You can see this also in a Cree um, position of the unconscious is a great essay right toward the end. It's like the final two or three pages, terrific stuff in there. A lot of which is resonant with what we're reading here in seminar 11. Now we come to some important stuff beyond this conceptual, almost ontological argument. To recover and restore this fact of life, apart from or at least unbeholden to the so-called facts of life, is what it means to live out the drive. And I would suggest that this is precisely what the end of analysis should be. A subject able to live out their drive in the field of enjoyment jouissance, unbeholden to the facts of life as put forth by the symbolic. Now, this is not just coming from Lacan to me. This is also at work toward the end of Bruce Fink's terrific introduction to Lacan, a clinical introduction to Lacanian psychoanalysis, which he in turn pushes all the way back to Miller in readings, reading seminars one and two, toward the end of that text. There's an essay by Lacan, and Miller has this commentary on the text, worth checking out. This notion of traversing the fundamental fantasy so that the subject can live out their drive is absolutely crucial here. It's what is at stake in this discussion. To reiterate, libido for Lacan is the word for this element of pure life that is lost when the human organism becomes sexed. Libido is a lost sense of immortality of irrepressible life, of undivided life, of indestructible pure life. And jouissance, enjoyment, is how we experience 
this libido. Not before it was lost. We don't fuck around with what happens before things get lost. Libido can only be experienced as loss. And yet there is a way through the drive to recover and restore to the subject a sense of libido that is not constrained by the laws and orders of society. Here, sexed society. Jouissance is what this amounts to. This isn't jouissance at the level of transgression. I get off on breaking the rules, the primary one of which would be the pleasure principle. The type of jouissance we're talking about here, the type of satisfaction that the drive affords, when it seizes upon the primordially lost object of libido, which is not the breast, which is not feces, which is not the gaze, which is not the voice, something else, something more basic than that. This lost immortal sense of life. When the drive can drill down into that, the type of jouissance that is experienced, I would wager, is not at the level of transgression. This is not getting off all the more so because you're having sex, not in your bedroom, but in the bathroom on an airplane. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a field of enjoyment that the subject pushes into almost without regard for the demands and the desires of others. Now I told you this came from the book, so let's take a look. Pages 198 to 199 are terrific on this material. I'll give you a second to find them. 198, first full paragraph, absolutely worth checking out. And you'll see I have a Cree here as well because I want you to also have a sense of this other essay, Position of the Unconscious, which I mentioned. Very resonant with what we're up to here. I would suggest that the fun begins in the English translation on page 718 and goes to 720. So as always in reading Lacan, you've got these kind of drafty, brilliant seminars. And then you've got the crystallized version of the argument. So you can read chapter and chapter in Lacan seminars, and then you can usually find a spot in a Cree where you can get the whole thing in condensed form, in this case, in three pages. Pages. Bottom of 718 to 720. A little more than three pages and you got the whole thing. Wanted to call your attention to that too. But for our purposes, this is what we're reading, seminar 11. So let's take a look. Page 198, first full paragraph. Just underneath the phrase, it's zoological place. It is the libido, qua pure life instinct, that is to say, immortal life or irrepressible life that has need of no organ, simplified, indestructible life. You know who read the shit out of this paragraph? Deleuze. You know who also read the shit out of this paragraph? Guattari. This is one of the great origins of late modern affect theory. This is one of the great origins for thinking about bodies without organs. Or in the case of the libido, check it out, an organ without a body. It is precisely what is subtracted from the living being by virtue of the fact that it is subject to the cycle of sexed reproduction. This is the biological finality, reproduction. 
the biological finality of sex is reproduction. It's one of two elements that go into human sexuality. The other is enjoyment. The drives for Lacan are all partial drives, in part because they only represent one side of human sexuality. They represent the side of enjoyment. They are not about sexual reproduction. But part of what happens to construct a drive, to build a drive, to sustain a drive, is to undergo a kind of subjectification of the human organism as a being of pure, irrepressible life, a subjectification of them to the cycle of sexual reproduction, to the biological finality of sex. The drives deal with the sociological aspects of sex, the sociolinguistic aspects of sex. Here, what we see is a subject who is subjected to the cycle of sex reproduction and something gets lost in this process. And it is of this that all the forms of the objea that can be enumerated are the representatives, the equivalents. The objets ah are merely its representatives, its figures. This is what I meant when I said that the drives each have their own object. They're indifferent as to what the details of that object are. Fundamentally, they are all objets. They are all little a's, lacks, around which the drive circulates. We're going to talk about that this evening as well. What Lacan's saying is that whether you're into smoking cigarettes or sucking on breasts, fundamentally the object of your drive is the use of your mouth to wrap around some sort of a void, a lack, a little a. Ah, but that little a is itself representative of a more fundamental lack, this lack of pure life that is subtracted from the human organism when it becomes a little boy or a little girl in societal terms. So this is important here, this like almost a hierarchy of sorts. These objets ah are merely its representatives, its figures. The breast, as equivocal, as an element characteristic of the mammif mammiferous organization, the placenta, this is usually how Lacan thinks, right? There's the placenta, then there's the breast, then there's feces, then there's the phallus, then there's the, body, then there's the voice. Those of you that have seen the seminar 10 lectures we did, you can see how this whole cycle gets worked out. But the placental sac is important here. So he's always gonna to wanna to throw that in as something prior to the breast. <clears throat> The placenta, for example, certainly represents that part of himself that the individual loses at birth and which may serve to symbolize the most profound lost object. I could make the same kind of reference for all other objects. Whatever is the object of your drive, and Freud is right, the drives are indifferent to the object. They all have the structure of objet but all objets ah trace their origin to a very specific fundamental lack. Before there was the lack that caused desire, there was the lack that caused human sexuation. That's what Lacan is up to here. It's a radical move. This is not the lack introduced by the symbolic. This is a lack that is hooked into the real in a very curious and enigmatic way. Not unlike the way that the object of anxiety is not really an object, right? Because it's a lack, it's an empty space. That's why Lacan's always gonna say anxiety is not without an object because the object around which anxiety circulates doesn't really look like a thing on a shelf. It's the gap between the things on the shelf. He's doing something similar here to the point that he even wants to say that 
this real lack is at root unreal, not because it's imaginary. This is also in tonight's readings. There's a lot happening here. Our job is just to make sense of it. Now, for a little cap on this, shift over to 199, just to the right of where that paragraph on 198 ended. The paragraph begins the relation to the other. Check this out. He wants to reiterate this. He wants to make this point clear again. The relation to the other, he says on 199, is precisely that which for us brings out what is represented by the lamella. Now, this is some weird shit he's getting into. The lamella business starts on page 197. And what he wants to say is that all this wackadoo stuff about the lamella, which is pretty fascinating. Look up lamella. You can see like the, um, the plant-based understandings, the botanical versions of lamella. You can th think about it in terms of eggs. Um, if you're a Ridley Scott fan, girl, we're talking about alien. The lamella is the alien. I mean, serious, back up for a second. Bottom of page 197. What do you think's happening here? When he introduces the lamella on page 197 and then comes along and says, it's immortal because it survives any division, any Ciciparous intervention, and it can run around. Well, this is not very reassuring, but suppose it comes and envelops your face while you are quietly asleep. Oh, <laughs> it's great. This is a terrific moment. Um, I wonder, I wonder if Ridley Scott has read this passage. Come on, man, this is 64, right? When was Alien? Alien's like what, late 70s, early 80s and shit? Think about how that alien operates. This is not me, by the way. This is not me. Somebody else came up with this insight a long time ago, but this passage really drives it home. That the libido is the fucking alien that comes cracking out of your chest and runs across the kitchen table and gloms on to your homeboy's face. Seriously, suppose it envelops your face perhaps while you're quietly asleep. Okay, so that's where he introduces the lamella. Back to page 199 in all seriousness here. <laughs> what is represented by the lamella, he says on 199? Not sexed polarity, the relationship between masculine and feminine, but the relation between the lived subject, the living subject, and that which he loses by having to pass for his reproduction through the sexual cycle. Now, this is crucial. All drives are fundamentally sexual, but it's not because they represent the sexed polarities between masculine and feminine, male and female. No, the drives are sexual because they are our points of entry our ways into this relationship that he's talking about here. The drive is our point of access to the relationship that we each have between ourselves as living subjects. Notice how we've got the organismic element of life and the sociolinguistic element of subjectification here. As living subjects, we have a relationship to something that we have all lost by the sheer fact that we have each had to pass more or less through the sexual cycle. The fact that each body gets sexed in society is a clue to a relation that the drive gives us access to. There's a sense in which drive theory, first and foremost, is drive critique. The job of theorizing the drive is first and foremost to understand it as a critical mechanism for digging down into this relation between the living subject and what that living subject has lost in the process of being sexed, namely libido. The drive is where we see a way into that relationship and if the work is done correctly, I would suggest. Also a way to recover. Yeah, that value of that work, that so I will make certain that I share with you periodically. Yeah, 
in this particular homework is something that you need to be doing two minutes every day. Does that make sense, everybody? Are we good? Two minutes? Why only two minutes, two minutes every day? Like I mean, that sounds good, good but like, shouldn't don't you want more time to explore the relation between your status as a lived being, a lived subject, and your lamella? Don't you need a little more time with the alien than just two minutes a day? Yeah. So. Do you need more time to figure out that your life is on? Anybody? Everybody. Check and make sure that your mic is off. Turn your mic off. Turn, oh, Queens. Thank you. Did you hear it starting to feed back like that? The technological reel starting to creep out of its carcass and crawl across the kitchen table? Ready to land on your ass and remind you what you lost by being sexed. The same thing works here as well. Another great page for us to consider is 205. So think about the fact that <laughs> we can make damn. Just damn. But check out 205. Notice too how we pass from the accident, the encounter with the real to what more or less amounts to the perverse act of resubjecting all of us to the voice and its diction one more time. Come on, nobody turned their mic off after realizing that was their shit creeping through and then turned right back around and turned their mic on again, except in a strictly sadistic fashion, <laughs> I would submit. But we were on page 205. Check out about six lines down. It's almost like Lacan just wants to cut to the chase here. And almost after 205, the shift is pronounced. We're going in a different direction after 205. But this summative moment in 205 is terrific for us along the topic we've been discussing. In all good things with Lacan, you got to go back a little further than wherever I point you. So really, the action starts at the bottom of 204. So at the bottom of 204, he says, sexuality is established in the field of the subject by, way, by a way that is that of lack. We've talked until we're blue in the face about lack. Everybody gets it at the level of subjectivity. But now notice the move. Two lacks overlap here. The first is the one that we're very familiar with. The second is the new one that he's introducing here. The first emerges from the central defect around which the dialectic of the advent of the subject and to his own being in the relation of the other turns by the fact that the subject depends on the signifier and that the signifier is first of all in the field of the other. This is the classic Lacanian notion of lack from the minus fee of castration to the objet a that is the object cause of desire, all driven by the living organism's integration into the symbolic, this process known as alienation or castration. That produces a certain lack, which we've talked about. That's the first lack here. Now for the second one. This lack, takes up the other lack, which is the real earlier lack to be situated at the advent of the living being, that is to say, at sexed reproduction. The real lack, now here again, this is a real lack that is being taken up by a symbolic lack. The symbolic lack we're so thoroughly familiar with <clears throat> takes up this real lack. It's what the living being loses that part of himself, qua living being, in reproducing himself through the way of sex. This lack is real because it relates to something real, namely that the living being, by being subject to sex, has fallen under the blow of individual death. 
Now we move one step closer to what we're up here to. The two key words come right at the end, individual and death. Now you can read on, Lacan continues in this vein for the rest of 205. For our purposes, that individual death part is pretty damn important. Let's see if we can figure out what's going on there. As you've heard, all drives aren't just sexual, they're also death drives. They are death drives for several reasons, some of which are really easy to explain and that we've always heard a lot about. Drives are excessive. Drives are repetitive. They seek their own removal. Drives are destructive. They pursue their own extinction, so on and so forth. Repetitive, destructive, excessive, that is all true of the drive. What oftentimes we forget to talk about is the way that drives, because they're sexual, are also death drives. Now, this is new shit. Let's see if we can crack the lamella out onto the table. All drives are death drives for several reasons. But one of them in particular calls our attention in this discussion. They are death drives on account of their relation to the living subject in a sexual cycle. Sexed being for Lacan is what he calls a deadly being because it subordinates the libido as pure undivided life to the bipolarities of sexual reproduction. We've heard this. At what level though is sexual reproduction occurring? It is occurring at the level of the species. This move that Lacan makes comes way earlier in our readings on page 150. Check out the move he makes on 150. There's something happening here at the level of the species. Now you'll note the two words from our last reading were individual and death. And now here I am blasting from the individual to the species. Let those with ears to hear. Page 150, about middle of the page. You can hear him there at the top talking about sexual division insofar as it reigns over most living beings. In fact, you might just wanna zero in on that passage. So the second full paragraph on the question of sex on page 150, blah, 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 last sentence. We know that sexual division insofar as it reigns over most living beings is that which ensures the survival of a species. Here's the turn. Whether with Plato, we place the species among the ideas or whether we say with Aristotle that it is to be found nowhere but in the individuals that support it, hardly matters here. Let us say, here's the key passage, that the species survives in the form of its individuals. Nevertheless, the survival of the horse as a species has a meaning. Each horse is transitory and dies. So you see, the link between sex and death, sex and the death of the individual is fundamental. This is the challenge that we're dealt with here. Sexed being is a deadly being because once you're a sexed being, you're all set to die. Have your kids and get the fuck off the planet, please. I mean, look at the environmental crisis we find ourselves in today. You've heard it from me before. We're the fucking problem. Not because we cause problems, but because we are the problem. There are too many fucking humans on earth. We're living too long. The solution for the species is for us to start dying. That's the motto here. 
we know it's true. The facts of life in the ontological sense, embodiment, care from others, death, can't be avoided. To be human is to die. It's at the level of sexual reproduction, though, that some kind of life, the life of a species, is able to be continued. And it's at that level that the death of the individual becomes important, fundamental here, as Lacan puts it. Let me be clear. A species only survives in the form of its individuals, insofar as they reproduce. But each individual of a species is transitory in the sense that they will die, which is how we get to that, I don't know if it's famous, but that totally bizarre pun from Heraclitus on page 177. You'll notice the other metaphor in the readings, it's archery. Fascinating metaphor. It's in part Lacan's effort to explain the structure of the drive where the arrow always returns to the shooter. We'll talk about that, don't worry. What we're doing right now is getting the big pieces in place before we get into the rather technical discussion of the four elements of the drive and the three voices and all that kind of stuff. So just be cool, but check this out. Page 177. Here's the bumper sticker that attends the passages we've been working on. And it's from Heraclitus and it's a pun. Middle of the page. Lacan writes this motto on the board. To the bow. B-I-O-S with an accent over the O is given the name of life, B-I-O-S with an accent over the I. And its work is death. This pre-Socratic moment, Lacan thinks, captures what's cracking in the relationship between life and death in the field of the drive. There's a very real sense, if you look at the diagram that then pops up on page 178, this is an archery image. The circle that is labeled rim is the source, the erogenous zone. It is also the place to which the arrow of the drive returns. See the arrow? See the fletching at the bottom right, and then see the arrowhead? That's an arrow. That's why he's talking about arrows and archery all over these pages. He has a vision of archery that would be like shooting your arrow straight up into the air. And let me tell you, as a kid from Indiana, this is something my brother and I did all the time. We've been building bows since we were kids. And we both shoot instinctive archery, build our own arrows, this whole phenomenon. Been doing it for years, always from a Zen tradition. It's more about breath and form than it is about hitting any kind of a target. Lacan's version of that is shooting an arrow straight up in the air, which is hella fun, but also hella dangerous. So that you can then hear it come whistling back down and stick in the dirt, ideally not inside your corpse or in your brother's corpse, but instead in the dirt, like between you guys. My brother and I used to stand at different ends of the field and shoot arrow behind trees and then shoot arrows as close to each other as we could get them, like 100, 200 yards away. And it was great. You would just hit behind a tree and waited for some arrows to drop. And the rule was, until you get the other arrow, like don't come out from behind the tree. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't fire two arrows. Shoot one and then wait for the fool to get the arrow out of the ground and so forth. This image on 178 is Lacan's version of archery. You shoot the arrow straight up in the air. It goes up, rounds the curve, and then comes back down to the source. We'll come back to it in a second. But this is how he introduces it, via this fragment from Heraclitus. To the bow as a kind of life, bios is given the name of life, bio, biology, right? But its work is death. This dialectic of life and death 
is what's cracking at the level of the drive. Drive is sexual. And it's a death drive for that very reason. Because the job of sexual reproduction isn't just to turn out new life. It is also to die along the way. Again, though, remember what's at stake here, analytically speaking, clinically speaking. To recover one's libido at the level of the drive, in the field of enjoyment, and to do so apart from the demand of the other. And thus, apart from our own desire even. You see, there's need, there's demand, there's desire, and then there is the drive. It's related to desire, but it is well beyond it as well. To do this is to recover some unreal, pre-real, because non-existent experience of life in the midst of death. This is an important part about how the drive is lived out. The drive is lived out in the field of death, where time is limited. In the field of what you can see in the graph of desire, where Lacan places the drive, the field known as castration. Notice the drive is not on the side of jouissance in the graph of desire. In the upper right-hand quadrant of the graph of desire, the math theme for the drive is on the side of castration. It is from within the field of castration the very origin of your introduction to the symbolic, this process known as castration. It's from there via the topmost arch in the graph of desire, an arrow of its own, that you can get to jouissance. The drive doesn't occur in the field of jouissance. It occurs in the field of castration. What it shows though, is an ability to enjoy in the midst of castration, and yet in a way that is not beholden to the demand of the other. This is what's at stake here. To keep the drive alive is to always keep alive the possibility of experience jouissance in a way that is not transgressive, but simply fucking heedless. I don't care what the symbolic says. In fact, I care so little that it's not even on my mind as I live out the drive. This is the traversing of the fundamental fantasy that is not very well explained in Lacan. In fact, in seminar 11, he's gonna come out and say, nobody's ever talked about this shit. And then he doesn't talk about it either. It's readers after Lacan, Miller to Fink, that tradition, that makes a lot of this traversing of the fundamental fantasy. To traverse that fundamental fantasy is to leave behind the demands of the other and our desires as an extension of that. My desire is the other's desire, you know. In the midst of all that, unshackled from it, there can be something more invigorating, something more vital, you can outlive all of that in the Deleuzian sense, not outliving in the sense that it dies before you, but outliving in the sense that you just live a better fucking life, a bigger life than the life assigned to you in the field of castration. That is a redemptive theory of the drive. I think we can now talk a little bit about the drives themselves. And here we're gonna enter into some more familiar territory, but as always, in a way that breaks it down and makes it understandable, I hope. So if you look up drive in like, I don't know, the Dylan Evans dictionary or no subject, wherever you get your info from, you'll usually see this table. 
where four drives are outlined, oral, anal, scopic, and invocatory. The oral and the anal drives are on the side of demand. They're driven by the demand of the other, which we'll talk about tonight. The scopic and the invocatory drive occur on the other side of castration, and they're driven by the desires of the other. It is the gaze of the other that fires your drive up if it's a scopic drive. It is the voice of the other that fires your drive up if it's an invocatory drive. So oral and anal have to do with the demands imposed upon us by the other. Scopic and invocatory have to do with the desires of the other. Now that might just sound like nothing to you now, but let's see if we can make at least heads or tails of the demand part, because it is really important here to understanding how the drive works. The other thing to note is that all drives have the same multi-part montage-like structure. Montage because it's not bipolar. And I mean that in the sense of having two poles, like human sexuality. The drive is sexual, but it is not subject to the polarities of sex. The image that Lacan has of a drive is more of a montage where you have four things kind of cracking at once, the four parts of a drive. So here's what I wanna do. First, I wanna talk about how a drive is produced. Where do these things come from? What is the drive's relationship to need, demand, and desire? Then I wanna look at these four parts of the structure of the drive, thrust, aim, object, source. The drive also has three voices, which we could probably spend some time talking about, active, reflexive, and passive voice. And then we really have to hammer home this point we've been making tonight about what it means to live out the drive in a way that extends beyond the pleasure principle. That's where our readings for tonight started, and that's where our discussion of these readings should probably end. Emphasis on the word probably. So first, let's get back to basics, need and demand. If you've seen my lectures on the subversion of the subject, I delivered them last summer, it's like a three-part series. There's a lot of time spent in there on developing the cycle of need and demand and how that facilitates desire. You've heard it in a brief sketch. We can go ahead and do it again in a brief sketch. Need. When a baby is born, they are in a state of pure need. They have needs. Their needs are bioanimalistic. They're material needs. Hunger, thirst, sleep, all this kind of stuff. This is like the hierarchy of needs anchored in the fact that we are bioanimals, biological beings, organisms. This is organismic. And when a child experiences a need, they cry out. Now, I'm not saying they have a distinct sense of like, oh, I am hungry now. And so they cry, thinking about their stomach. Something just feels off with the kiddo. And they cry. The job of the primary caregiver, this is according to Lacan, is to transform that need into a demand by interpreting it. A demand is a need expressed in language. And the way that first happens is the child cries out in a state of material misery. And the primary caregiver guesses and assigns the meaning of that cry by simply doing something. If the baby cries, and you show up with a blanket, you just told the kid what the meaning of the cry is. The meaning of the cry, if you show up with a blanket is, I am cold. It's so extreme that if you've ever brought up one of these little worms, you know that they can actually learn different ways to cry. You've seen this before. You're out with somebody who has a kid, you're out at their house, y'all hanging out and some kid cries in the other room and the parent perks up for a second. And they're like, oh no, that's not a real cry. No, he's fine. He's fine. 
And then something goes on and they, oh, no, that's a real cry. To you, that shit sounds exactly the same. But that kid has learned by way of interpretation, presented meaning brought to the cry by the primary caregiver, that when shit really goes haywire, this is the frequency at which to cry. That tells the parent, come and get me fool, I'm in deep shit. Then there's the cry of just annoyance that doesn't require action. And the child learned that if I cry at that level, it produces no action on the parent's part. The primary caregiver doesn't show up. The meaning of the cry is not determined by the child. It is initially assigned to the child by the parent. This is the first place where we see the demand occurring in the field of the other. It is the other who initially transforms the cry into a linguistic expression. It is the other's demand that determines the meaning of the child's need. The demand of the other, demand as issued by the other, determines, and in so doing, bars the needs of the child. Now, what we know in order to get from demand to desire is that if you show up with a blanket when the kid cries, let's say you guessed right and the kid was actually cold. You put the blanket on them and the crying goes away. This is the thing about needs. Needs can be satisfied. They can be sated. The need for hunger, the need known as hunger, can go away if you put some food on that shit. Needs can be satisfied. And if you guessed right and you brought a blanket to the cry and the cry stop, you're good to go. And you know how this works. You bring a blanket and the kid throws it to the side or you can see they're sweating. Okay, it's not a blanket. Maybe they want food. You give them some food, they throw up, oh damn. Easiest thing to do, you just start by checking the diaper. Wet diaper, clean diaper, no, you just change the diaper. Okay, let's figure out something else. But you kind of work through the list, guessing. It's the guesswork of the parent that attributes meaning, hermeneutically, so to speak, to the cry of the kid. Now, what happens when you bring a blanket or food or a clean diaper? That's not just a way of satisfying the need, meeting the need of the child. In that moment, what you're also doing is caring for the child. And the child experiences that as care, as affection, as love. So if every time the kid cries, you show up and put a bunch of food in them, what you're basically telling the child, according to Lacan, is that this is what love looks like. In particular, this is what it means to love you. Every time you cry, I bring food. That tells me that you are to be met and satisfied at the level of food intake. And so you can see how this might spin into an eating disorder further down the road, where somebody, in order to feel good about themselves, loved, held, supported after a tough day, eats, I don't know, not one, but three pints of ice cream. Pack it in to the point of feeling quite ill, passing from the field of pleasure to the field of pain. That's a certain type of jouissance, not the one we're after, but it's a certain type of jouissance. Enjoyment at the level of overeating. Desire is what's left of demand after need has been met. In fact, you can just have a simple mathematical equation. Desire equals demand minus need. What's left after the blanket has been brought and the child is now warm? It's an insatiable desire for love. Nobody attending to the work we're doing here has been loved too much. That's not how that shit works. You might've been smothered. There may have been somebody who provoked anxiety in you by constantly being up in your business, but no one has ever felt loved too much by too many people. Love 
the desire for love, the demand for love is insatiable. This is one of the ways that we get at a Lacanian theory of desire. It's the insatiable demand for love that remains as a remainder after needs have been met. Desire is what's left of your demand after the need has been met. And it is always in that sense, a desire for love. We can be more precise. Desire is always embodied. Desire is always a body's desire for another body, which is why you've also heard me run the argument that desire is first and foremost desire for another person. But in order to get your desire for that person met, you have to guess and approximate and imagine the desire of that person. What other things do they like? And in so doing, you find yourself desiring as another person. In order to get your desire for another met, you oftentimes have to guess what they're into in addition to you. Approximate and identify with that thing. It's an imaginary object. This is the imaginary phallus. And in so doing, you find yourself living out your own desire at the level of what you imagine someone else's to be. The word for that is fantasy. In Lacanian terms, that is what fantasy is. A split subject living out their desire in terms of what they think others want. The imaginary pre oedipal triangle between the child, the maternal figure, and the imaginary phallus shows this being played out. You can see this again anytime there's a middle school level dating experience where in order to get your crush to like you back, you have to guess what they're into. And if they're into heavy metal, you show up wearing that Megadeth t-shirt that you got on eBay the night before. If you think they're into Westerns and horse riding and shit, by God, you get yourself some cowboy boots. If you think they like a wild person, what do you do but mess up your hair before you walk into the classroom that day? You try and get them to want you by guessing things that they want that aren't you. Cowboy, metalhead, so on and so forth. Thank God for the paternal function to show up, cut in, and say, y'all best knock that shit off. That one doesn't know what they want, so stop trying to be it for them. Stop trying to guess it. What a relief that is. What a relief when somebody shows up and says, you know what? This person that you're trying to figure out, they don't know what the fuck's going on themselves. So stop guessing. Just do you, boo-boo. Don't worry about what they want. Ah, oh, what a relief that is when that can actually happen. The paternal function is just that. It cuts in and says, the maternal figure does not have the phallus and you, the child, cannot be it for them. So how about y'all just knock that shit off? If that goes well, you get a neurotic. If it's totally non-existent, or at least if the subject is unwilling to accept it, you get an origin of psychosis. And if they kind of uh, accept it, it's not, they kind of disavow it, they're not quite gonna go along with it, welcome to the pervert. It all turns on what happens in that moment. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're trying to get at the drive. Need, demand, desire, as desire for, desire of, and desire as. All of the Lacanian theories of desire that are culminating in the early 60s now give way to a theory of the drive. And that theory of the drive, I'm telling you, is hooked into a very specific approach to the sexed being. Let's think about how the drive emerges from the process here. Let's take the oral stage again, if you accept that there are stages. In the oral stage, it is the subject of pure need, the child 
who is demanding of the big other. They cry out, bring me the food. Of course, they don't say that, they say wah. But notice, again, it is up to the big other, the primary caregiver, to determine the meaning of that cry. It is the need expressed at the level of the cry, interpreted by the big other, that subjects the oral phase once more to the demand of the big other. The field of demand is controlled by the primary caregiver at this stage. The child can cry, but that cry can only be meaningful in the field of the symbolic, where the big other, the primary caregiver, is operating. This is why, for instance, in the lower left-hand quadrant, the lower left-hand node, if you will, of the graph of desire, you see a little withered S next to a big A. That is meaning assigned to need by a big other, a whole other, because not barred, supposed to have all the answers. The anal stage. Notice the shift here. Now it is not the crying baby that puts forth the demand on the big other. Now it's the big other, the primary caregiver, that issues the demand to the child. Shit! Shit now! Now's the time! Take a shit, please! Do it! No, don't do it! Do it! Don't do it! No, do it! Do it! Don't do it! Ah! It's the primary caregiver who issues the demand. Notice at the anal stage, it is still the primary caregiver who is calling the shots. And in each case, in the oral stage, when weaning occurs, the breast becomes an object that is pulled from the child. Now, I'm not saying it has to be an anatomical breast. It could be the bottle of formula that you and your husband have been giving to this child. But that food, when weaning occurs, is withheld. And if it's done so dramatically, that partial object that is withheld from the child can get charged with a certain amount of energy resulting in an oral drive where the lack of that object, breast, bottle, otherwise, becomes the object cause of your desire and the object around which your drive will circulate at the level of stand-ins for it, cigarettes, hangnails, and the like. The anal stage, potty training, the commandment to shit the demand to produce feces. This also feels like a kind of prohibition. The first lost object, excrement. I mean, actually like a piece that falls off the child the child can point at and say, damn, that's a part of me, is completely within the field of the other's demand. And if you accept that there is a phallic stage, you can see Lacan suggesting some of this in seminar 10, the one just before this seminar, where you would see the minus phi of castration giving way to objaya, which we've talked about in here as the experience of lack. This is where desire emerges. But look, this is still occurring at the behest of the big other. It's happening to you, but it's somebody else who's doing it. That's the experience of the so-called phallic stage. The emergence of desire is my desire pegged on yours, which is why I emphasize desire for, of, and as. It shows that desire is always at some level, not just a desire for you, but me trying to desire as you in order to get that desire for you met. Take one step up and you're at fantasy a split subject living their life out in terms of what they think everybody else wants. This is the math theme for fantasy in the graph of desire. Here's the point. In each case, the subject of pure need is barred and eclipsed by the demand of the big other. It's always in and on the terms of the big other that the subject of pure need is placed under erasure, 
cast out. And here's the question for the drive. How is it possible to get from an understanding of the object as demanded by someone else from us to an understanding of the object as something that's truly lost, a truly lost object. Living out the drive is about shifting from an understanding of the object as demand to an understanding of the object as loss. And we know the fundamental loss that we're talking about here. It is a loss signaled by Lacan's use of the word libido. All of the partial objects that occur in weaning and potty training and the like, the things that are prohibited, they become the partial objects around which a drive circulates. Figures of object A. So to review that again, the oral drive has a partial object known as the breast. The anal drive has a partial object that is excrement. The scopic drive has a partial object that is the gaze. These are all the things that are removed from the lived experience of the child and prohibited. The invocatory drive has the voice. Now, each of these partial objects, breast, excrement, gaze, and voice, they're all the same. They are all objea. It's to the point that every drive has an object, but every drive is also completely indifferent to what that object is. If you have an oral drive, again, it doesn't mean that the object of your drive is a breast. You can have all these other stand-ins for the breast. It can be the coffee that you drink in the evening, the cigarette. What matters is not the object that you put in your mouth, but the mouthing of it itself. What the drive gets off on is not the object, but the operation of a certain erogenous zone. So let me summarize this for you, looking at this archery image on page 178. Okay, the bottom circle where you see rim, this is the source, and there are going to be four terms here. There's a source, there's an aim, there's an object, and there's a thrust. So the source is going to be an erogenous zone, an opening with a rim-like structure. In the case of the oral drive, it's the lips. Anal drive, it's the lower lips your anus. Notice these are all openings in the human body. In the case of the scopic drive, it's the eyelids. In the case of the invocatory drive, it's the outer ear. These are all openings in the human form. That is what the source is. The source is going to be an erogenous zone. It's a point from which the drive emerges and a point to which the drive returns. The force behind that movement is referred to as thrust. And this thrust is not biological. Why? Because it is constant. Lacan wants to point out that a biological urge is rhythmic. It comes and it goes, like the seasons. But the thrust of a drive is constant. It is always there. It is ever present, pushing forward. So it comes out with a constant thrust behind it. It circles around some sort of an object to which it is indifferent. 
This is all straight from our readings, by the way. I'm on pages like 165 to like 180 or so, just summarizing this for you. The aim of the drive is not to actually get that object. The aim is instead to exercise an erogenous zone. It's not food that satisfies my drive. It's ordering it from a menu with my mouth. That's what gets me off, is not the consumption of food. It's the using of my mouth. The aim of the drive is a satisfaction beyond the pleasure principle and the pleasure-displeasure circuits that it puts us on that is achieved by way of the operation, not the object of an erogenous zone. If you have an anal drive, you don't get off on shit. You get off on using things like your ass. You get off on withholding things or giving things. You get off on performing at the level of everyday life what your anus does when you take a shit or decide not to. All gifts are fundamentally shit for this reason. The first gift was always the gift of shit, not just because your parents clapped when you finally pooped in the toilet. Think how pleased they were when they received that gift of shit. All gifts are, 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 are shit because, and shit is the first gift because it's the first thing that you could withhold. You could have chosen not to shit the same way you can choose not to give somebody a gift. Expressions like it's the thought that counts capture this. It's all shit that we give each other. It's the thought that counts. It's the fact that you were willing to give me something. You see, what gets me off is not the thing or the object that you gave me, but the operative logics of giving that caused you to show up with something. It's you being here giving me something. It's the act of giving, not the gift that is supplied that pleases me, that satisfies me. This is the point. The aim of a drive is not to get hold of and annihilate some object. It's to operationalize an erogenous zone. It's the operation of the mouth, not the object of food that I like when I have an oral drive. We could absolutely point out pages for this. If you want to read more on thrust, pages 165 to 168. If you want to read more on aim, page 179 is good. Object, page 180 is terrific. If you want to read on source, well, keep poking around, you'll find it. Let's take a second and look at the object reference on page 180 comes a couple pages after this diagram. And again, the rim is the source. That lower circle shows you the source. You can see the aim. Little a is the object. And the goal, that return circuit, also refers to the source. And the arrow itself marks the thrust, as it would emerge from a bow. But let's focus on this object, that little bitty A. It's the smallest element of the diagram on 178. Page 180, right at the top. This object, which is in fact simply the presence of a hollow, a void, which can be occupied, Freud tells us, by any object and whose agency we know only in the form of the lost object, the petit a. The objet petit a is not the origin of the oral drive. It is not introduced as the original food. 
it is introduced from the fact that no food will ever satisfy the oral drive, except by circumventing the eternally lacking object. It is not about food if you have an oral drive. It's about using your mouth. That's as close as we need to come at present to a summary of the structure of the drive. What we have right now is a partial object for each drive, a bunch of stand-ins for that object, all of which function as obje a, the cause of desire, and drive is a manifestation partially of desire. And then we have underneath this whole apparatus, a real lack, not the object ah, that society conditions for us, the lack that causes our desire, but something real, Lacan says, a, a lack that is earlier, more primitive than this. This is the lack that can be realized in the figure of the libido that we've been spending some time talking about tonight. The bit on the montage is all four of these structures of the drive popping at once. It's worth noting, but for our purposes tonight, you can find better resources on this, the voicing of the drive too. There's a verb attached to each drive. The oral drive has the verb to suck. And the exploration of the drive, its manifestation, you can tell I'm not entirely like enthusiastic about this because it just, you know, it's not as exciting as I think it could be. There's an active voice, the oral drive, you get off on sucking on things. There's a reflexive voice, you get off on sucking on yourself. And I'll leave you to fill in the blanks on all this stuff. And there's the passive voice, you get off on making others suck you. That's important here. It's not just that you get off on passively being sucked. There's a very active element here where you are making someone suck you at the level of the drive. The first two, the active and the reflexive voices, Lacan says they're autoerotic. There's no identifiable subject there to speak of. As we move toward the passive voice though, a new subject pops up, a very active one too. It makes oneself be sucked. The verb for the anal drive is to shit. You enjoy shitting. You enjoy shitting yourself. And you enjoy making others shit on you. You see, which brings us to the scopic drive. You enjoy seeing, seeing yourself and making yourself appear before others, forcing them to see you. Invocatory drive, you enjoy hearing, you enjoy listening to yourself and you enjoy making yourself heard by others. So you have these voicings too that go along with the drive. The most profound thing that we get from our readings is this element of drive satisfaction bringing us back to a restorative relationship with something that's lost, a real loss. What is this undivided, pure, indestructible, immortal life, pure life that the subjectification of sexuality strips us of. Lacan's gonna call it libido. It's not what Freud means by libido. It means something different. To keep the drive alive is to keep the hope of the libido alive. The drive, when done right, eludes and escapes the demands of the other. It also eludes and escapes our own desires, which of course are pegged on the desires of others and gives us a way of accessing enjoyment that is not about breaking society's rules, 
but about living as though there aren't societal rules, if only in moments. That's a different approach to the drive. Yes, you can experience the drive at the level of transgression. The drive can be experienced as a transgression of the pleasure principle, but that's not the only way the drive gets beyond the pleasure principle. There's another productive end of analysis way that the drive can get beyond the pleasure principle by traversing the fundamental fantasy, which has us and all of our objahs wrapped up in the big other, in society, in all the normative logics of, in this case, sex. There's something beyond that. And I would suggest that it's here in seminar 11 in these final few chapters that Lacan has stumbled upon it, this beyond of fantasy, a version of the drive that is not beholden to the demands of the other, but that nevertheless occurs in the field of castration. Pay attention again to the top arc of the graph of desire. From the field of the drive in the field of castration, there is an opportunity to return to jouissance. There's a lot to say about this, a lot more than what we've been able to cover tonight, but these are the basics. So with that, we're gonna pause, take a few questions and see where the night leaves us. <laughs>